The Miracle of the Rose There's a story they tell sometimes. The old men don't tell it anymore, but some of the old women do. And mothers tell it to their children sometimes, at bedtime when the colorful picture books with the happy dogs and kittens and animals who wear pants and coats and hats have gotten a little too worn. Sometimes an older child, one who doesn't need bedtime stories anymore, will ask about it, having stirred some old memory, and their fathers, who don't believe in magic anymore, will say to them, No, son, it was no miracle. It was just how things happened. His mother, though, if she still believes, or maybe even if she doesn't, might still be willing to sit down and tell the story of the rose. Once upon a time, she'll begin. Then maybe she'll realize that her son or daughter doesn't need to be tucked into bed again, and she'll change it maybe with relief that she won't have to clean the story up to better suit the younger ears anymore. But always, always, however the words go, the story starts off with the rose. The rose grew in a pothole at the corner of 2nd Avenue and Tritton in front of Angela's, in a bad part of town. It was a scraggly thing, its leaves brown at the edges and its stems tough and thorny, but the flower was a perfect, deep and pure crimson. It grew there in defiance of traffic and people alike, and though its leaves were brown and ragged, the flower bloomed as soft and pure as if it were in the botanical gardens all the way across town. No one knew when the rose had sprouted there or remembered when first it bloomed. It was in people's memories as if it had always been there. Cars drove by, rival gangs taunted and jeered at one another over it, and hookers sold themselves by it, stepping over or around the rose and into cars with tinted windows. Not all that infrequently would a police cruiser park next to the rose, or bullets would fly over it and bury themselves in the bricks of Angela's, or across second in the rundown bulk of Triton Apartments. But no one ever ran over the rose or stepped on it. No one ever picked the rose, or even tried to. Sometimes someone in gang colors and a hoodie would glance at it and kneel as if to touch it, or a car's wheel would line up with the weathered stem, but the hand would always be withdrawn. The car would always swerve away at the last minute. Sometimes the teller will pause, as she used to when the child would still ask, was that the miracle, mommy? But that wasn't the miracle of the rose. Nobody knew how the rose got there, or when, and nobody disturbed it. It was always there, seen, but ignored. One day there was an accident. Sometimes there will be a pause here too, because you never can tell with some children. The car hit the pole at the corner and went partway through the face of Angela's brickwork and everyone said it was a miracle that nobody was killed. Maybe it was, too, the storyteller may concede, but that wasn't the miracle of the rose either. The man and his wife and their child were fine, although the car was totaled. He, the driver, said later that a bird had swooped across the street and he had reflexively swerved to miss it. It was a kestrel, he said. He was sure of it. Although nobody had been injured, the rose had not been so fortunate. The tough stem was scraped and bent and the single bloom hung by a few mutilated fibers. As the crowd gathered and the man and his wife glumly surveyed the wreck that had been their car, the child went over to the rose and began to dig in the pothole around it. I want to dig it up, the child said when they asked him what he was doing. I want to save it. This place is too dangerous for it. Nobody stopped the child. By this time, a crowd had gathered around the wreck at Angela's and across the street in front of Trenton Apartments as well. Second Avenue, the teller might now be able to admit, was at that time the place where the territory of two rival gangs came together, and it occurred to some that a lot of the people on both sides of Second Avenue wore the colors of these two bitter enemies. Soon there would be insults hurled across the street, and with so many there to see, neither side's pride would allow them to back down. All of a sudden, some who were close say they saw one of the young men in a hoodie kneel by the child and help dig, his long gold-plated chains and bling clanking on the asphalt as he scooped dirt and gravel out of the pothole with his gold-ringed hands. One by one, other people knelt to help the child free the rose. A prostitute who had narrowly missed being run down when the accident happened and who had stuck around for the police to arrive while feigning an injury, took off her shoes and, without a word, passed them to the diggers around the pothole who used their improbably long heels to lever broken chunks out of the road. Across Second Avenue, the rival gang began to sense that something was amiss. Their jeers and taunts fell on deaf ears and no one, not even the man and his wife who had not been happy to find themselves there even before the accident paid any attention to them anymore. 
In ones and twos, knives and pipes and chains at the ready, they swaggered their way across the road, and then they, too, helped the child dig or pass their homemade weapons to the diggers. By now, the pothole was huge, and the crowd of people digging or watching in silence nearly blocked the road. Police and an ambulance finally arrived and, finding no one injured, began to try and disperse the crowd before they themselves joined in, under the spell of whatever power had come over that place. One of the officers called in for backup to help the child dig, and the dispatcher promptly advised him that this time he should sober up before he tried driving anywhere. In the center of the crowd, in the great hole in the road, was a mound of earth and asphalt and gravel topped by the stricken rose. The child explained that for the rose to live, its roots had to be carefully dug out so they wouldn't break, and the rose's roots ran deep. Nobody questioned or even thought about questioning the child. Everybody helped. In the hole, the sometimes leader of the gang from across second took out an evil-looking knife and handed it to one of the officers who thanked him and handed the muddy spiked-heeled shoe he'd been using back to the prostitute apologizing and thanking her before he went back to carefully scraping away dirt with the borrowed knife. Men in hard hats with flashing orange lights on their truck came and started yelling at the crowd and waving their hands, but soon they too fell under the spell and produced a pair of shovels and a pick, and they too worked to free the stricken rose. If the child is old enough, perhaps the teller will admit some of the words they used at first, or perhaps not. When they had started yelling, the words they used had not been very nice. Eventually, the crowd drifted apart, leaving the man and his wife and the police officers in their muddy uniforms and the men from the highway department standing uncertain around a huge hole in 2nd Avenue. The police officer handed the borrowed knife back with a word of caution about the safety of so sharp a blade, and the young man it had belonged to slipped it back into the sleeve of his grubby coat and jovially slapped the officer on the back before wandering somewhat aimlessly away. There was no trace of the rose or the child, and nobody seemed to know where they had gone. Or when. It was as if they had never been there, they all agreed, except of course they had been. After all, everybody had seen the rose and the child. Everyone that was, except for the man and his wife. What child? they asked the officer. Your child, the officer said. The little boy that was in your vehicle when the collision occurred. I never saw a boy, said one of the paramedics, who was still trying to think of a believable boy to explain the mud all over her clothes and to keep from getting it all over the ambulance. I remember a little girl trying to dig the rose out of the hole. We didn't see any children here and we certainly don't have any yet ourselves, the man and his wife protested. And so it was. Everybody remembered the stricken rose and everybody but the couple who had been in the accident, or the collision as the officers kept referring to it, remembered the child, but no two witnesses could agree on a description. Some, including the paramedic, remembered seeing a blonde girl five or six digging in the hole. Others said she was a brunette or a redhead. Others never saw a little girl but instead agreed with the officer that the child had been male. Some thought he had been younger, some older, but the general consensus was around six years old. The car's remains were towed off to the salvage yard, and they bought a new one with the insurance money. And for them that was the end of the whole strange affair. They did have some trouble with the insurance company at first due to the husband's insistence on having seen a kestrel in a city far outside the bird's range but eventually he agreed with him that it must have only been a pigeon. As for the miracle, well, for a few hours one afternoon, in a bad part of the city, people had come together. The two gangs declared a truce, but then turned their attention away from each other and found new rivals. Prostitutes still plied their trade, showing themselves off in heels and fishnets and makeup, but little else. And drug deals still went down, and there were still sirens and police vehicles parked in front of Angela's patched brickwork. But something remained in that place. It may have been some fragment of whatever spell had come over those people for a few brief hours, or it may have been something else entirely, or maybe it was simply a memory, and the brief faint scent of rose that sometimes comes on the wind at the corner of Second and Trenton may just be the imagination, excited by a strange story from years ago. Everyone has their own opinion, and nobody knows for sure. Perhaps, though, some seed was planted that day, and like a rose it grew and blossomed, rendered invisible by time, a plant made visible only in peculiar and unexpected acts of charity and kindness, of unlikely friendship, and of hope. Angela's is long closed now, and the old Triton apartment building was torn down and rebuilt years ago, but the sirens are gone now, too. The highway department, except for the two men who were there, disagrees, and tells a story not of magic, but of mass vandalism and destruction of public property. 
But they weren't there, and they don't understand. They don't care about the rose. She may pause again, almost at the end of the story, once again allowing space for an oft-asked question. But mommy, I don't understand. What's the miracle? The miracle of the rose, she once would have said, is something you'll understand when you're older. Now, though, she thinks, casting about for a real answer. It's about people, she says at last. It's a miracle about people. Rubbish, her husband may say, if he happens to be present, and if she's in a bad mood, he may sleep by himself on the couch for it. But she really isn't mad at him. He just doesn't believe in magic or miracles anymore. <laughs>